Jerry, thank you for that warm introduction. It's, uh, Rick and I were speaking just uh, sidebar before the session got underway, and it's not lost on me that Jim Augustine has been speaking now for three years at the reimbursement conference, presenting the key elements of ED benchmarking as they influence reimbursement. And here we've unsiloed once again, and we've got the reimbursement guy coming and speaking at a benchmarking conference. And I think it really speaks well of all of us that we're trying to go in the exact direction that Sherry mentioned, which is that triple aim of care and quality in the right place, but we do need resources to keep that ship afloat. We're all paid directly or indirectly based on RVUs, and we are going to unmask the RVU system. Uh, I see a lot of friendly and familiar faces here. There are also some folks who maybe haven't lived in the reimbursement world, so we'll start by generating a little bit of common knowledge, and then I promise we can get as complicated as folks want. Since we're at a benchmarking conference, and throughput is one of the key elements of benchmarking, we certainly want to pay homage to the patients per hour perspective when you look at RVUs per hour. What we're going to do, though, is isolate for the 30-minute period here on the RVUs per patient. That relates to your documentation and coding, not turnaround time and throughput issues, which are incredibly important, ultimately, to reimbursement and revenue at the macro level for your whole department. So where are the RVUs, these magic things? And maybe we'll take a step all the way back. What is an RVU? Relative value unit, and it's what Medicare and all the other payers pay for one unit of physician effort. Looking at a gigantic database of paid claims, 83% of a typical ED docs RVUs come from just five codes, 99281 through 99285. Another 8% come from critical care, and the last 9% come from procedures lacerations, abscess, orthopedic procedures. There are three reports that we can look at to get our arms around at a very, very easy macro level, 99281 through 99285. The average E&M, E&M distribution, and if there are significant downcodes. You can then trend your own critical care. Using those two processes, you've already got your arms around 91% of the revenue that's coming into your department. Critical care, anybody know their group's critical care percentage? How many running 3%? How many running more than 3%? How many running more than 5%? All right, so pretty sophisticated audience here. That's great. Here's an easy benchmark. 0.2 to 0.3 times your admission rate is typically a reasonable range for critical care. And then we'll hit some key items, areas where we can make an impact on that final 9% as well. So since 81% of the RVUs and all the way up to 91 end up in just six codes. Let's spend some time understanding them. Critical care, 99291. 8% of a typical ED docs RVUs coming from 99291. Now let's break down that 81 through 85. 40%, 40% of your RVUs come from just one code, 99285. Now it's beyond a 30 minute lecture where we're supposed to talk about the underpinnings of the RVU system, the current payment processes, we're going to actually try and get the crystal ball out and look at the future to really develop robust benchmarking around this. And if anybody wants to have that conversation afterwards, I'm certainly happy to. 30% of the RVUs come from 99284 and 10% come from 99283 with very small contributions from level one to level two. Importantly, if we look at the RVU delta between critical care and 99285, 1.4 RVUs, between 99285 and 99284, 1.6, and between an 85 and an 84, 1.58. These are almost the same. So the difference in your own E&M distribution between a three and a four, a four and a five, and five in critical care, they're equally important, equally important. What's an easy way to look at that? You can look at the average E&M. That's a single number that sums up the entire area under the curve. We've got the average for the group here in blue, 3.76. This happens to be real data. I wouldn't say it's national benchmark data. It's not adjusted for volume, acuity, primary, tertiary status. 4.27, this is our night doc, working away, seeing a lot of abdominal pain and less conjunctivitis. And here, just so this sticks in our minds, we've got most of our fast track providers and physician assistants. We've got a whole half hour on physician assistants and nurse practitioners, mid-level providers tomorrow. And here we've got Dr. Red at 3.44, lagging the group average. And Dr. Red doesn't work in the fast track. Dr. Red works in the main ED. So we know we have a problem there. 
and we look at Dr. Red's E and M distribution, here's the group in blue, Dr. Red in orange, the group is running 32.9%, and Dr. Red, 19.1%, level fives. Where did all of these level fives go? They went all the way down here to 99283. What would be a common problem that would generate that skew in the e &M distribution? Turns out Dr. Red is a part-timer. Epic is a new install at this site. Dr. Red is not such a good typist, isn't open to using Dragon, and is struggling through various submenus to document their HPI, and has tons and tons of HPI downcodes, which you can see on the downcode report. 91% of our RVUs coming from just those six codes. Average ENM, ENM distribution, and downcode report. Three reports for your department. They take about five minutes to look at, and you can get your arms around them. And then critical care. We had a great show of hands here. Nationally, our specialty running about 2.5%. And then for Medicare, you can break out the Medicare data separately, and that's actually published. It's on the ASAP website. If anybody has trouble finding it, my contact information is the last slide. I'm happy to provide it. National, across the entire country, 99291 for Medicare, 7.4%. Southern California, 10.65%, and the great state of Maine is 1.77%. Why is that? So is the answer that sunlight actually makes you sick? It's, it's not. We all see the same types of patients. They vary a little bit by volume, by acuity, by whether we're a trauma center, what tertiary services we have, but they don't vary much across states. And really has to do with the practice settings. Southern California, very sophisticated, typically uh, outsourced processes. So let's look at critical care. 10 hour shift, 2.1 patients per hour, you see 21 patients. One critical care patient per shift puts you at 4.7%, 4.7%, and you're right in that sweet spot. And again, you can benchmark yourself, 0.2 to 0.3 times your admission rate and there's a 1.4 RVU difference, and if we look over the course of a shift, you can gain over 1.4 RVUs. So we've talked about 99281 through 99285, a benchmark for critical care, and the three reports to look at. Now we want to finally include procedures. And my concern is that particularly in a benchmark group, folks go right to RVUs per hour. RVUs per hour have too many variables. We need to isolate how does my level five look? How do are my level fours, my level threes, my benchmarking of critical care? Now we can finally look at RVUs per patient, which includes procedures. Now that we know the metrics that are out there and what we're measuring, let's pull the curtain back a little further and look at the underpinnings of the RVU system. This process has been in place going on three decades now. This is the RBRVS system. Work RVUs plus practice expense RVUs plus liability insurance RVUs equal the total RVUs for a given code. Those RVUs are published every year around November with a January 1st effective date in the Medicare Physician Fee Schedule Final Rule. How many are paid based on work RVUs? Work RVUs. How many are paid based on total RVUs? A couple of more hands on total. The RVUs times the conversion factor equal the Medicare payment or the Blue Cross or the United Healthcare payment. If you pull that contract back, there's always a conversion factor in there. When we've talked about the physicians are going to be cut 20%, the doc fix is going to cost $300 million. What's being referred to in the lay press is the conversion factor, what Medicare is paying for one RVU. And that process is now gone. And we'll spend sort of the last 10 minutes talking about the evolution. Here are our RVUs. I have 2015 and 2016 here for comparison. The work RVUs almost never changed. The last time we had a work RVU change was in 2012. I don't think we're going to have a work RVU change in the, in the near future. What I usually do just to demonstrate that is, has anybody in this room received the survey from the Relative Value Update Committee to gauge their amount of cognitive and physical effort for a 99285? All right. Dr. Drillis, I don't think you've received that survey this year. You have received it in the past. Has anyone received it in the last year? Okay, thank you for that clarification. Um, well, so without sort of sharing any private information, it takes a long time to digest the survey information, and I think we can all conclude probably no changes for the couple, next couple of years. Work our views will remain stable. Each year, Medicare adjusts literally at the hundredth of a decimal point, the practice expense in the liability insurance RV. So for instance, 
Look at 99284. 2015, 2.56 work RVUs. 2016, the same, 2.56. We have tiny changes here in the liability insurance at the hundredth of a decimal point level from 0.24 down to 0.23. And the total RVUs as a result went down from 3.33 to 3.32. Our RVUs are stable. What Medicare pays per RVU has changed drastically from one year to the next, and we'll focus on that a little bit more. Since we're all paid based on RVUs, I think it's important to drill down on where the RVUs live and some relative comparisons. EKG, 0.24 RVUs. Anybody know roughly what Medicare pays per RVU? So it's about 36 bucks right now. So EKG is about a $9 service. 99282, 1.17 RVUs. Finger laceration, 1.67. Facial laceration, 2.14. And that's why it's so important to document the difference in that location from the finger to the face. Intubation, grossly undervalued, a life-saving service, 3.17 RVUs. This was actually just presented at the Rock, and we argued for a higher valuation, and it was a, a very well-received argument, and I think we'll see some higher values in the future. Central line, 3.51. Chest tube, 4.91. 99285, 4.90. CPR, 5.33. Critical care, 6.31. And then the big guys, the big procedures, the orthopedic procedures. Why are the orthopedic procedures so highly valued? Because the orthopedists were on the board that determined the very first set of values back in the early 90s. Look at this. Shoulder dislocation, 8.18 RVUs. Collies reduction, 11.64 RVUs. And just to demonstrate the politics, TMJ dislocation. Well, I don't know, that's kind of in the musculoskeletal. That's a bone, it's dislocated didn't fall under the purview of the orthopedist. The ENTs didn't care about it. 0.92 RVUs. A-line, nobody cared about it in the 90s. 1.49. LP, 2.25 RVUs. So let's see. LP, 2.25. Facial act, 2.14. And then, just to really drive the point home, that patellar dislocation that my high school senior daughter could fix, 9.64 RVUs. Isn't the clavicle fracture like 10 something? So the question is, what about the clavicle? Fracture, isn't that and it's about 6.8 RVUs for a clavicle fracture. We've talked about 99281 and 99285 and how important, in particular, that 99285 is with 40% of our RVUs coming from. We've talked about benchmark and critical care. Let's spend a little time optimizing that third bucket. There are about half a dozen ways that ED physicians typically we undervalue our high complexity work at the bedside. First is complex IND. Typical community emergency department sees three, four, five abscesses a day. The vast majority of those abscesses, the vast majority presenting to an emergency department that require incision and drainage are probably complex. Complex, according to the coder's desk reference, is I drained a large amount of pus. It wasn't a paronychia. I probed to break up loculations or I put packing in. In the post-community acquired MRSA epidemic, most of these, like 80%, typically, when you look at large databases, end up being complex. Look at the valuation, simple, 2.77. Complex IND, 5.12 RVUs. If you leave here with just one fact, take that back to the, to the home shop. Demonstrate that you're performing a complex IND, packing, probing, breaking up loculations, according to the coder's desk reference. And what was a 99285? 4.90 RVUs. Complex IND, 5.12, more RVUs than a 99285. Laceration repair. Lacerations are valued based on the location. We talked about the difference between, let's say, the face and the fingers. And one of the biggest differentiators in laceration repair is when you go from a simple to an intermediate repair. And there are two ways that that happens. One is you close it in two layers. Fine, that's obvious. It's typically documented. The second is that it was a single layer closure, but it was heavily contaminated, and we picked debris out of the wound. There was some gravel, let's say, in the wound. A two layer facial repair, 5.80 RVUs. Going back to that 99285 at 4.90 RVUs. So if you pick gravel out of the wound, let's make it obvious, state that it's an intermediate repair, and make sure that the coders capture it. CPR, 5.33 RVUs. The issue with CPR is just to make sure Whatever your billing and coding process is, that that piece of paper, which is often the case still, even in a highly integrated EMR world, 
Make sure that the CPR coach gets into the medical record that's exported to your coders. If they don't see it, they can't code it. 5.33 RVUs. And then we talked about the ortho procedures. The shoulders are obvious. How many folks reduce their own colleagues fractures now? So with the orthopedist, you know, they get 60 RVUs for a hip replacement. So they're not as excited about the colleagues fracture reduction. That's fine. We're happy to do them. The patients get care very quickly. We meet our core measure for long bone pain management, which we're happy to talk about more. There were some interesting issues with the ICD-9 to ICD-10 code changes. And then the other one to think about is post-arthroplasty. The orthopedist decided that was a really involved process. So do these need to be done in the operating room still? 11.49 RVUs. They need to be performed in the Dipravan room, which in my place is room nine. 11.49 RVUs. And then EKGs, 40,000 visit ED, just a typical sort of community benchmark, $80,000 available. How many able to bill for EKGs? They won that appropriate politics. Great, terrific. X-rays, about $4 a visit. And then ultrasounds. And I, I'm a strong proponent of ultrasounds. How many folks billing for ultrasounds? Billing, terrific. One of the problems when a conversation comes up related to billing for ultrasounds is folks are looking for it to create tons and tons of revenue. That is an unfair burden to put on what is a low-ish value from an RVU per service perspective. Most of the ultrasounds that we perform, limited abdominal ultrasound, fast exam, which actually comprises two studies, they're about one RVU. A reasonable goal for the ultrasound program is to enhance patient throughput, enhance quality of care, make rapid diagnoses, help with recruitment and retaining the youngest, best, and brightest physicians, and the program should at least be economically self-sustaining. So if you can generate at a 40,000 visit ED, one and a half to 2% of those patients receiving ultrasound studies at about one to 1.2 RVUs per study, 35 to $45,000, you can buy a machine, you can maintain a machine, you can maintain credentialing, you can have a reasonable QA process and a place to archive the image. That's the reasonable economics for ultrasound, not that it has to generate hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. So we've talked about the way to manage and measure our RVUs and a couple of opportunities, in particular critical care and procedures. The benchmarking process for that level three, level four, level five process, that's a whole sort of full day discussion and doesn't fit well within the confines of a 30-minute lecture. So now we're going to move to the future. We talked about the Medicare conversion factor and that concept in the lay press that docs are going to be cut 20%. The doc fix is going to cost $300 million. That's all gone. April 14th of 2015, Senate vote number 144, otherwise known as House Resolution 2, was passed. It is called the Medicare Access and Chip Reauthorization Act. And what we do in Washington is we take these complicated names and then we make them into acronyms. And we take the acronyms and we make that into a word. So nobody knows what's going on besides the consultants. So this is called MACRA now. It's called MACRA, just so you have the, the nomenclature. MACRA completely did away with all future, all future cuts to the conversion factor. All future cuts to the, we will not hear during our careers, oh, the docs are going to be cut 20%. There's none of that 11th hour begging to Congress. We have updates in place for the next 11 years. We have little half percent increases rolling forward. We got the first already, July 15th of 20, uh, Q3 of 2015. We went up to 35.9335, so I said earlier, about 36 bucks Medicare payment per RVU. And for those who really like the data, Table 60 of the Medicare Physician Fee Schedule Final Rule gives the detail of how we got to the January 1st, 2016 conversion factor. There are a couple of technical adjustments here. 35.8279, that's Medicare's payment per RVU, 35.8279. You put that along with the RVUs that we showed for the 2016 published values, and here's what Medicare pays per code. $175.56 for 99285. Poor Dr. Ed goofing up his HPI, struggling in Epic with all those HPI down codes. It's going from $175 down to $62.70. And again, when we talk about the difference between a five in critical care, between a four and a five, a three and a four, they're almost the same. So each one of those levels is very important. How many are involved in PQRS? Probably a lot since we're at a benchmarking quality conference. PQRS has become very, very challenging for emergency medicine. 
Um, the Quality and Performance Committee is one of the most active committees within ASEP and does an enormous amount of work to try and protect our specialty from not having an opportunity, not having a way to participate in PQRS. Just by way of background, value-based purchasing will be the key mechanism for transforming Medicare from active payer, moving towards value, getting away from volume, getting away from quantity, moving towards quality, which is what everybody in this room is committed to. This is the original quote from Herb Kuhn, then the deputy administrator at CMS. It's time to change the fee-for-service system to really get away from the consumption of care model and focus on quality and avoiding unnecessary costs. That sounds pretty harmonized with the mission of this conference and the folks in this room and transitioning from payment for quantity and resources. And it ended up back in 2007 as a PVRP program, now called the Physician Quality Reporting System. The Physician Quality Reporting System has a lot of money at risk for emergency medicine every single year. So right now in 2016, we all have 6% of our Medicare money at risk. 2% if we fail to satisfy the PQRS requirements under what's called the traditional PQRS program, and then another 4% under the value-based modifier program. Well, I don't know, I'm a benchmarking guy and I like data, but uh, how much money is 6%? Is it $100? Is it $40,000? It's exactly this much. 45,000 visits, I tried to model it for a typical community emergency department. 20% Medicare, which is pretty common. 9,000 Medicare patients at $135 a patient. About 1.2 million in Medicare revenue for that group. 1% of Medicare revenue is $12,000. 45K group, you get a 6% penalty, $72,900. 45,000 visit group typically could have, for instance, in a fee-for-service model, could have seven partners, $10,000 per partner. So PQRS in 2016 for a typical community hospital group, $10,000 per partner. So it's very meaningful, and as we'll see, growing very, very significantly over time. The PQRS program has been vexing for emergency medicine, and it's only through very significant work by multiple committees, and uh, in particular the Quality and Performance Committee, that we've remained with a viable solution. If anybody wants to talk to me about their own personal PQRS solution and issues for 2016, I'll be here all day, I'll be available after hours today, and I'll be lecturing again tomorrow. That program, as we know, it continues through 2018. And then the PQRS program, the Meaningful Use program, and the MOC program all go away. And as the government tends to do, it, nothing really goes away. They just call it a different name. They will all be rolled up together into the Merit-Based Incentive Payment System. And this is, now we're taking the Washingtonian rhetoric to a new level because we took a complicated concept. We're going to take three programs. We're going to roll them all together. We're going to call them something else. Merit-Based Incentive Payment System. Then we're going to take an acronym that doesn't even spell the words that it's made up of, because I guess MBIPS would be too hard to say. So the MIPS program, just so we all have the nomenclature, we'll be talking about this for several years to come, 4% at risk in 2019, up to 9% in 2022. 9% of our pay, plus or minus, will be tied to how we score under this MIPS program, and it really harmonizes quite well with the mission of this group. Quality, probably it'll be a regurgitation of some form of PQRS. Resource use, in the end, that's just cost. Clinical practice improvement, MOC part four, and EHR meaningful use. And this is what the transition looks like. We're gonna get these little half percent raises every year, up through and including 2019, and then the MIPS program kicks in and we're up to 7% by 2021, and by 2022 we're up to plus or minus 9%. Imagine if you were on the minus 9% side and the group down the road is on the plus 9% side and you've got an 18% difference in what you can afford to pay people. Who will recruit and retain the best and brightest? So we all want to make sure we have a solution and we've got a couple of years to figure it out and everybody's wor working hard to figure out the way emergency medicine will fit into satisfying the MIPS program. In addition, I see a question, sir. Yeah. You're saying you get 0.5%, but it looks like it stops in 2019. I thought we were getting that across the board. That is a great question. Hey, I thought we were getting that half percent forever. Well, we get the half percent from July 1st, 2015, up through 2019, and then 2020 all the way through 2025, 
flat. No extra raises. Then 2026, assuming we're all here still doing this, we go to a quarter percent raise that gets sort of forecasted out a little bit further. I decided that this was probably a pretty sophisticated audience, and I, I think I'm getting that sense. So I feel good about bringing this next piece of information. This will likely be one of the major drivers for emergency medicine reimbursement starting in 2019, alternative payment models. The reason the alternative payment model program will be a big driver is because it involves not just Medicare patients, but likely will involve all patients, and we will be providing our own data to CMS. The MIPS program will probably evolve to be a little bit of a stepchild. It's going to be very hard to satisfy all of the requirements. The alternative payment model program will give us a 5% bonus if we hit a certain threshold of our patients involved in alternative payment models. What's an alternative payment model? We've got a group of like 30 people really committed meeting monthly to try and figure that out. But as an example, the ED group might hire a discharge planning coordinator, complex COPD, CHF, end-stage renal disease patient comes in, and the discharge planning coordinator that lives on the books, on the profit and loss statement of the ED group, whether we're employed, fee for service, doesn't matter, it's part of our department budget. And we'd probably, for a 40,000 visit community hospital, need two FTEs, so maybe about $100,000 in cost. And that person will help to coordinate post-discharge care for that patient to lower the inpatient or observation admission rate. That's a general sketch of what an alternative payment model might look like. We've got a lot of different ideas bouncing around, and we have until about 2019 to get there. In the 16 pages in the Medicare Physician Fee Schedule Fauna Rule that describe alternative payment models, the words the secretary shall, which is Washington speak for, we're making it up as we go along, appear 37 times. So I think the program will have to get flushed out a little bit more, but I wanted to at least put it on everybody's radar as the future. The last thing I'll touch on related to the future is resource use is under pressure. How many right now feel a little bit of pressure related to admissions and CAT scans, for, for instance? Yeah, quite a few hands. There's a real economic driver behind that. Your hospital is now typically being paid one fixed amount for that ED visit with most of the ancillaries bundled in. They used to bill on what's called a cost plus basis. They built for the CBC, built for the CAM7, built for, if you got an ankle and a foot x-ray, whether they were required or not, built for both of them. Now, they're all packaged into a single cost, and I included the payment amounts, how many at times argue for more staff and try to come up with an economic argument to capture left without being seen patients. So just so you have that information, 99284, $329.99, so about 350 bucks by Medicare for that 99284, and then your private payer contracts are two to three times that amount. So now you have at least a little bit of real economic data to argue for additional staffing. That's, I decided that would be helpful to, to include. Most plain films, most labs, some ultrasounds, and then lots and lots of minor procedures all being bundled into a single payment for our hospitals. And that's why that microscope on ED resource use is really gonna continue to be turned up. A Couple of conclusions. Monitor those key reimbursement benchmarks. e &M level critical care and procedures. Our views are stable for 2016, which is terrific. Probably stable in the near future. The SGR is gone, but it's been replaced by quality and resource use under whatever different name we want. We want to call it MIPS. We want to call it alternative payment models. All the things that this group spends time talking about, focusing on, publishing on, researching, they are all the drivers of reimbursement going forward, whether it's through alternative payment models or through the MIPS program or directly because resource use is now being economically driven to our hospitals as a cost that they don't receive any extra payment for. My contact information is here. I receive inbound email questions from folks all over the country. I'm happy to take questions at any time. Thank you.